This video contains images of graphic violence and warfare. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi, Gusio. Half a day and aloha mai kako. Welcome to today's side event titled Demilitarizing the Pacific, Luchu, Okinawa, the Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, and Hawaii. This event is for the United Nations Human Rights Council 46th session from 22 February through 23 March in the year 2021. It is under the auspices of In Common Dios, a non-governmental organization in consultative status with the Economic and Security Council of the United Nations. This event is also co-sponsored by the Kwani Foundation and the Peace for Okinawa Coalition. We would additionally like to thank our Commonwealth 670 and the Luchu Independence Action Network for your support and cooperation. My name is Robert Kajiwara, founder and president of the Peace for Okinawa Coalition, a nonprofit organization led by millennial Luchuans in order to promote Luchuan culture, history, language, and issues. My petition to stop the illegal construction of the new military base at Hinoko, Okinawa has over 212,000 signatures on it. Luchuans have been working closely with native Hawaiians as well as with Chamorro, the native peoples of Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands, to help each other in our shared goals. For generations, our island nations have been under U.S. military occupation, denying us of our democratic right to self-determination and causing numerous human rights violations that threaten our lives and livelihood. The U.S. military often transfers troops between these island nations to the detriment of the native and local peoples. Now, Luchuans, Hawaiians, and Chamorro have come together to jointly oppose the U.S. military buildup and occupation of our islands. All of the speakers in this event are indigenous to the Pacific. I am native Luchuan, also known as Okinawan or Uchinanshu. Next, we have Professor Hoshin Nakamura, who is also native Luchuan. We have Representative Sheila Babauta, who is Chamorro of the Northern Mariana Islands. Then we have H.E. Leon Kalahau-Siu and Madam Ruth Bolme, both of whom are Native Hawaiian. We ask that the United Nations and the international community at large hear the voices of the indigenous peoples of the Pacific who have long suffered under U.S. military occupation. First, we turn our attention to the Luchu Islands, also known as Okinawa or Uchina. Luchuans are the indigenous peoples of Luchu as recognized by UNESCO and many other human rights organizations and scholars. Based on archaeological evidence, scholars believe that Luchuans have inhabited the Luchu Islands for at least 32,000 years. Geneticists have pointed out that Luchuans are genetically closer to the Ainu, the indigenous peoples of Japan than to modern Japanese people. Anthropologists have pointed out cultural and social similarities between Luchuans and indigenous peoples in Taiwan, as well as in Southeast Asia. For centuries, Luchu prospered as a center of trade, diplomacy, and cross-cultural exchange, and maintained close, friendly relations with China, Korea, and Southeast Asia. Luchu and China had a particularly close, important, and mutually beneficial relationship and Luchu often acted as mediator between China and other nations. In 1609, the Satsuma clan of Japan invaded Luchu, forcing Luchuans to pay tribute, though Luchu maintained its sovereignty. During the 19th century, Luchu became recognized by the Western nations as an independent country under international law with the signing of treaties with the United States, France, and the Netherlands. In 1879, Luchu became Japan's first colonial conquest when it invaded and illegally annexed Luchu against the will of the Luchuan people, throwing Luchuans into poverty and forcefully changing the name of Luchu to Okinawa in an attempt to erase Luchu's history as an independent country. During World War II, Japan placed an inordinate amount of military presence on Okinawa Island, the largest island of Luchu, 
with the deliberate intent to sacrifice native Okinawans in order to protect the Japanese homeland. This resulted in the Battle of Okinawa in 1945, which killed around 200,000 people, including one fourth to one third of the indigenous Okinawan population. After the war, Japan's other colonial territories regained their independence, except for Luchu, because the United States military decided to keep Luchu for itself to use for bases. From 1945 to 1972, Luchuans lived under direct rule by the U.S. military and had no form of democracy or self-rule. There were numerous problems with this arrangement and Luchuans strongly resisted military rule. Thus, in 1972, the U.S. gave Luchu to Japan without any type of vote or plebiscite from Luchuans. Luchuans demanded a return of independence, though both the U.S. and Japan ignored this since 1972 up to the present day, Luchu remains under de facto joint occupation by both the U.S. and Japan. Under this arrangement, the local Okinawa prefectural government is nothing but a figurehead and is powerless to promote or protect the rights of the Okinawan people since both the U.S. and Japan regularly violate and overrule the Okinawa prefectural government. Since 1972, the amount of military presence on Okinawa Island has increased substantially. Although Okinawa comprises less than 1% of Japan's land area, it contains over 70% of Japan's military presence. The military causes numerous problems for Luchuans, including economic deprivation, crime, military accidents, noise pollution, and environmental contamination, including the poisoning of Okinawa's supply of drinking water with cancer-causing agents. The military takes up around 15% of Okinawa's land area and around 30% of the arable land, yet contributes just 5% to Okinawa's economy, running at a severe deficit and creating a huge economic burden on the Okinawan people. Currently, the US and Japan are building another military base on Okinawa at a location called Henoko, which contains a coral reef filled with hundreds of rare and endangered species, such as the Okinawa dugong. The Luchuan people strongly oppose this base. My petition demanding an immediate stop to the base's construction has over 212,000 signatures on it, though both the US and Japan have completely ignored this. On 24 February 2019, a referendum was held in which the people of Okinawa overwhelmingly voted against this base, However, the U.S. and Japan have ignored this as well. Thus, we are asking that the United Nations and the international community at large please respond to the Okinawan people and protect our rights from U.S. and Japanese militarism. For more on this, we turn to Hoshin Nakamura, Professor Emeritus of Okinawa University. He is native Luchuan and survived the Battle of Okinawa in 1945, in which at least one out of every four Okinawans were killed. Professor Nakamura has degrees in Asian Studies from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and Seton Hall University. He taught history at Okinawa University for over 20 years and has also taught at University of Maryland and University of the Luchus. Professor Nakamura has been involved in the Luchu independence movement for over five decades. He last spoke at the UN Human Rights Council in 2019. Professor Nakamura, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. I'm an indigenous Ryukyuan, Hoshi Nakamura. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to report on remilitarization issue and the Ryukyu Hawaii independence of the stolen kingdoms of the Ryukyu and Hawaii that is located in Western Pacific and middle of the Pacific, respectively. This is a map of the Ryukyu, map of the Ryukyu Islands. The people of Ryukyu Kingdom maintained very peaceful and friendly relationship with China, Korea, and the Southeast Asian nations, as well as Japan. Uh, from the 12th century to the early 17th century. However, people of Ryukyu Kingdom encountered the series of disasters brought by the outside invaders in 1609, 1879, and 1945, respectively. The indigenous Ryukyuans uh, have suffered from 
undemocratic and inhumane control of the outside powers. The power to self-determination and human rights have been taken away from the indigenous people. In 1879, Japan hijacked Ryukyu Kingdom. King Shotai and his family, his government officials were kidnapped to Japan in spite of their strong opposition and resistance. Japan established military bases in the Ryukyu to fight the Pacific War in World War II. In 1945, the bloody Battle of Okinawa was fought between Japan and the United States with its allied powers. In three months battle, about 240,000 lives were lost, but more than a half of them, about 123,000 Ryukyuan people died in the battle. After the total, total defeat of Japan, the US military forces should have allowed the Ryukyuan people to become independent, just like the neighboring nations restored independence. Instead, the US forces stayed and confiscated the large area of the islands and constructed huge military bases in the Ryukyus. The indigenous Ryukyuans lost their large, rich farmland and fishing zones. Poverty and starvation prevailed all over the islands. Many islands women were raped and murdered by the US soldiers. The US military base generated accidents and uh, incidents threatened the daily lives of the island people. Drinking water and soil have been contaminated by toxic chemicals like PFOS, P4, defluorine, etc. Furthermore, the Ryukyuan people have been suffering from noise damage caused by roaring sounds of the flying jet planes over their houses, schools, very early in the morning and very late at night. All these are not allowed in the United States, but both the US and Japan says it's okay in the Rikyus under the US-Japan State Security Treaty and st Status of Forces Agreement known as SOFA. The Ryukyuan people have suffered too much and too long under the foreign control. The human rights of the indigenous Ryukyuans have been violated. Now is the time for the oppressed Ryukyuans to become free from the outside powers. In order to become free and restore the power to self-determination, both the USA and Japan must return their political power back to their owners, the Ryukyuan people, immediately. We, the people of peace for Okinawa coalition, strongly demand the immediate reversion of the stolen Ryukyu Islands back to the inhabitants of the Ryukyuan, Ryukyu Islands. When many colonized nations became independent after World War II, like India, China, Korea, Philippines, and other Southeast Asian nations, they were economically not independent. However, most nations became independent after 1945, when Second World War was over. And they restored their economy by using the power to self-determination. That is very important. When Japan became independent in 1952, Japan's economy was very weak. Many people were living in poverty and I saw many uh, beggars everywhere. At that time, Japan became independent. But Japan regained the power to self-determination. By using this power, Japan became rich, affluent, industrialized. So independence doesn't come from economy first. It comes from political. Political power is very important. The power to self-determination come from independence. 
by using this power to self-determination, many nations, not only Japan, India, Korea, China, and other countries, gradually industrialized, developed, and became self self uh, supportive nation. Ryukyu Kingdom was independent before Japanese invasion took place, and Ryukyuan people were enjoying affluent, prosperous, uh, peace, peaceful, and longevity. But this was lost because of foreign control. Power to self-determination was taken away with in independence gone. Since then, our ancestors have long suffered until today. We don't want our future generations live under the uh, slave-like uh, subservient people under the foreign control like today. Look at Henoko. The new military-based construction is going on by destroying beautiful Oura Bay in this moment, in spite of the fact that more than 70% of the island people voted not to build the uh, new military base. We have enough, more than enough, too much military installation, too many. Before reversion 1972, Ryukyu had less than 10% of US military bases in Japan. But immediately after reversion 1972, all the US uh, Marine bases and forces were transferred to Okinawa. Today, after reversion, US military bases and forces in Okinawa counts for more than 70% of US military installations in Japan, which the Okinawa is only 0.6% in uh, uh, to total land area. So the governor, Tamaki, Denny Tamaki, is claiming U.S. military bases in Okinawa should be reduced to less than 50% in the first step and gradually uh, get rid of all the uh, military bases. So that is the uh, situation of Okinawa. More than 25 independent nations without uh, established uh, military uh, forces, but uh, you know, no no country is invading them because today, international world is operated under the uh, uh, world uh, uh, universal international uh, law. So uh, we are not living in the uh, country like a pre-war. We are living in a democratic, law-abiding, uh, peaceful. Uh, world today under the United Nations. So uh, when Okinawa becomes uh, independent again, we become free from US-Japan security treaty and the status and forces agreement, which, which means both United States and Japanese military forces must leave Okinawa automatically, and we become a military free, peaceful nation, democratic nation, prosperous, happy, uh, enjoying longevity, which we can share with the rest of the world. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Nakamura, for those insights regarding the situation in the Lushu Islands. As previously mentioned, Luchuans have been working with the Chamorro, the indigenous peoples of the Mariana Islands, in our shared goals of demilitarization and self-determination. The U.S. military is attempting to transfer 5,000 Marines from Luchu to the northern Mariana Islands and Guam, allegedly in order to reduce Okinawa's military burden. 
However, the U.S. continues the current construction of the new base at Hinoko, suggesting that Okinawa's military burden is not being reduced at all. As part of this transfer, the military is building up its installations on the Mariana Islands, which will greatly harm the environment, the people, and the culture. This transfer will not solve Okinawa's problems as the military will still maintain a very large presence on Okinawa Island and all of Okinawa's largest military bases will remain operational. Thus, under this arrangement, both the people and environment of Okinawa and the Mariana Islands will be harmed. So, Chamorro and Luchuans are jointly opposing this military buildup on our islands. To hear a Chamorro perspective on this, we turn to Representative Sheila Babauta of the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, also known as the CNMI. Sheila Babauta is passionate about contributing to a brighter Marianas. At the age of 29, she gained the trust and confidence of her community in Precinct 4 and began serving as a member of the 21st CNMI House of Representatives. She continues to serve in the 22nd CNMI legislature and currently holds key leadership positions as chairwoman of the Natural and Cultural Resources Committee, vice chairwoman of the Education Committee, floor leader of the Saipan and Northern Islands Legislative Delegation. She believes that responsible management of natural resources is essential to improving quality of life in the Marianas and ensuring that future generations have access to these resources. She aims to promote policies that preserve biodiversity, supports ecological balance, and encourages the sustainable management of our resources to contribute to the long-term economic development in the Marianas. Her long-standing commitment to service is evident through her involvement in organizations such as the Marianas Young Professionals, the Talaboa Stars, Pride Marianas Youth, Our Commonwealth 670, and Friends of the Marianas Trench. Leadership development remains a priority for her as a current member of the first cohort for Obama Leaders Program, Asia Pacific, and recent alum of the sixth cohort for Pacific Century Fellows Program, Marianas Chapter. Representative Babauta last spoke at the UN Human Rights Council in October 2020. Thank you, Representative Babauta, for joining us today. The floor is yours. Half a day, tiro, and greetings from the CNMI. We are the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, and we'd like to thank Peace for Okinawa for inviting us to join in on this critically important conversation about demilitarization. The CNMI is made up of 14 islands in the Pacific Ocean, home to the indigenous peoples of the Chamorros and Carolinians. Our ancestors have cared for our land, air, and waters for thousands of years, living harmoniously among all beings protecting our islands for future generations, preserving our culture and our language in the value and in the spirit of stewardship and responsibility. For this blessing we call home. My name is Sheila Jack Babata. I am a member of the 22nd CNMI House of Representatives. And as an advocate and protector of my homeland, we join in with our indigenous brothers and sisters in raising awareness of the massive growth of militarization happening in the Pacific and in the world. We in the Mariana Archipelago are often reminded of our geopolitical strategic location on the map, described by military officials as the tip of the spear, first line of defense, objectified to serve and sacrifice in this grand military industrial complex. The recent decision to relocate thousands of troops from Okinawa to Guam came after decades of high profile crimes, rapes, pollution, and accidents during training and testing activities. The long history of suffering and abuse is now being transferred to our part of the Pacific. It is being transferred to the Mariana Archipelago. Initially, we were told there would be limited impact, limited testing and training in the Marianas, but later discovered there would be more in store for us, and we had no say in the matter. The Mariana Islands Range Complex was developed in 2010, also known as the Merck, and it was described by a DOD as the largest live fire training range in the world. 
at approximately half a billion square nautical miles surrounding Guam, Saipan, Tinian, Rota, and most of our northern islands, allowing for live fire training in and on our land, air, and sea. This is not the legacy we wish to leave behind. Then in 2015, the Department of the Navy signed a record of decision for the Mariana Islands training and testing, the MIT Environmental Impact Statement, which almost doubled the land and sea base range that allowed the Navy to conduct active sonar and explosives, live fire and training activities. The study area expanded to over 984,000 square nautical miles, larger than the states of Washington, Oregon, California, Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, Montana, and New Mexico combined. It includes 12,580 detonations of various magnitudes per year for five years. Allows for over 81,000 takings of 26 different marine mammal species, including whales and dolphins, per year for five years due to detonation, sonar, and other destructive activities. It allows for the damage or kill of over six square miles of endangered coral reefs, plus additional 20 square miles of coral reefs around Farallon de Mendeniza, a northern island, through the use of highly explosive bombs. What are we doing to our ocean? The very place we go to for food, recreation, and healing. The biodiversity is threatened. Our access to the ocean is threatened, and our quality of life is threatened. The CNMI Joint Military Training Proposal, CJMT, seeks to improve existing and develop new live fire and bomb training areas on Tinian and Pagan, with conducting highly disruptive and destructive training on Tinian for half the year with mortars, rockets, explosives, and other destructive activities, restricting access to local and historical cultural sites due to military training, the CJMT also aims to use the entire island of Pagan, a sacred and spiritual land for our people. Many indigenous peoples have never had the chance to visit the Northern Islands. Former residents are still waiting to resettle these sacred lands and the military is threatening that resettlement and our right to self-determination. In 2020, the Department of the Navy released the record of decision for the final supplemental environmental impact statement for the MIT to conduct training and testing in the Marianas as identified in alternative two, the Navy's preferred alternative, the most flexible and the most destructive alternative, reflecting the maximum number of training and testing activities that could occur in a given year. That assumes the maximum number of fleet exercises, anti-submarine warfare exercises, and an increase in rockets, mortars, missiles, active sonar, bombs, and so much more. What will be left for our children? My grandparents survived World War II. I grew up hearing their stories. I live to this day among the significant pollution left behind. Studies found significant bioaccumulation of heavy metals in the near shore environment of Saipan, associated with World War II wreckages, dump sites, and unexploded ordinances. High levels of heavy metal contamination were found at nearly 60% of all Saipan's shoreline. We are still experiencing the impact from World War II, decades later, and we are still fighting to restore the damage done to our homeland. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples emphasizes the contribution of the demilitarization of the lands and territories of the Indigenous Peoples to peace, economic, and social progress and development, understanding and friendly relations among nations and peoples of the world, and emphasizing that the United Nations has an important and continuing role to play in promoting and protecting the rights of indigenous peoples. So we urge you leaders to conduct oversight on the massive military growth threatening the health safety, sustainability, and livelihood of your indigenous brothers and sisters. We thank you for promoting freedom and peace. We thank you for this opportunity to share our story. And we offer a prayer that you remain courageous and strong in your role to promote and protect the rights of indigenous peoples. 
Thank you, Representative Babalta, for your insights regarding the situation in the northern Mariana Islands. As you can see, this military buildup is harmful for the local people and environment. Both Chamorro and Luchuans have been working together with our indigenous cousins across the Pacific in the Hawaiian Islands in our shared goals of self-determination, indigenous rights, environmental conservation, and demilitarization. For more on the situation in Hawaii, we turn to H.E. Leon Kalahau Siu, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Hawaiian Kingdom. For over two decades, he has been a prominent strategist, advocate, and spokesperson for Hawaii's independence. Minister Siu is a familiar participant in Geneva at the Human Rights Council and is working to restore or develop new relations between the Hawaiian Kingdom and other states. He is the chair of the Decolonization Alliance based in New York City, a co-author of the book Modus Vivendi, Situation of West Papua, and was nominated for the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. Thank you, Minister Siu, for joining us today. The floor is yours. Mahalo, Mr. Kajiwara. Aloha ya mai o ko, a hoi ke akua. Greetings to all of you from the Hawaiian Islands. It's my pleasure to be here today to uh, share a little bit about this topic, uh, demilitarizing the Pacific. Uh, this is something, of course, very near and dear to those of us who live in Hawaii because of the imminent danger we constantly, constantly live under with the United States military bases here. But I wanna give you a little bit of background uh, before we proceed. Um, most people believe or think of Hawaii as part of the United States, that we're actually part of the, as a state of the United States. Uh, actually, we are not, uh, that is not lawfully. The United States pretends that we are and, and claims that we are and acts as if we are a part of the, the states. But we, in truth, we actually are not. We were never, um, we never surrendered our sovereignty to the United States and we never, uh, the United States never acquired the Hawaiian Islands in, a, in any kind of lawful way. But how did this come about? And, and the topic that we're talking about, demilitarization, has very much to do with this relationship or so-called relationship that the United States has created with the Hawaiian Islands. So the Hawaiian Islands was a thriving, uh, prosperous and uh, progressive nation back in the 19th century and uh, had great relationships with the rest of the world. We had uh, treaties with 40 other countries and um, carried on lively trade and discourse with, with other nations. Uh, in fact, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, there were several opportunities or several situations that were going on, which um, required the United States, to, required the Hawaiian Islands to respond. And that one of them was the Crimean War. Um, this was going on uh, in, around 1854. Um, the you know, Hawaiian Islands decided that they would not want to participate in uh, foreign wars or to be drawn in. There was a lot of pressure from Great Britain and from France and from the United States for the Hawaiian Islands to become, in, become involved with uh, supporting one side or the other. Um, the Hawaiian Islands decided we were not going to do that. The Hawaiian Kingdom then uh, declared itself a neutral country. And shortly after the Crimean War, much discussion went on regarding neutrality. And this neutrality, the main, um, uh, would you say, the, the main principles of neutrality were actually worked out among four parties at the time. The United, uh, the United States, Great Britain, France, excuse me, five parties, Russia, and the Hawaiian Kingdom. Uh, so the Hawaiian Kingdom was actually involved in the discourse going on regarding the nature of sovereignty and, and basically and of neutrality. And basically what the Hawaiian Kingdom and the others agreed to was that ships coming into uh, our ports here in Hawaii um, would be treated 
as any other ships unless they were in the preparation for war or they were carrying war contraband, then, um, then they would not be welcome in Hawaiian ports. So, uh, so the Hawaii enforced this and actually it helped to contribute to the overall uh, understanding of neutrality in, in the world. So the ironic part of this was that Hawaii was one of the identified as a neutral country and in the middle of the Pacific. And, and of course, it was a very uh, advantageous position for Hawaii because we got along with everyone else. So the irony is that one of the parties who helped to establish this principle of neutrality of, of a nation being neutral in time of war, et cetera, uh, was the one that came in and overthrew our government. Uh, therefore, not only breaking our treaty with them, but also the principle of neutrality. Um, and, uh, and that country was the United States. So in 1893, the United States landed troops in Hawaii to assist a group of insurgents that wanted to overthrow the queen. And their motivation had to do with furthering the um, interests, the business interests of the sugar planters. Um, the United States motive in participating in this conspiracy was to seize power, or to seize the Hawaiian or to take the, uh, the Hawaiian islands so that they could uh, operate a naval base in the Hawaiian islands. So that was the motivation for the United States to participate in this conspiracy. Um, and that's what they were after. They were after Pearl Harbor to be a naval base for the United States because the United States had designs on the rest of the Pacific in order to, to prosecute their expansion into the, west of the, into the Western Pacific, they would have to have a mid Pacific uh, place for, for their ships. Um, and conveniently enough, the Spanish American war broke out and the United States then utilize this time to um, establish military, uh, its military presence in Hawaii. So since the Spanish-American War, the, the U.S. has continued its military buildup uh, in the Hawaiian Islands. Currently, the island of Oahu, at about 20, 22% of the land area of the island of Oahu is under military control and some kind of military installation or uh, areas with, where the military conducts its exercises. Um, so it's a large part of, our, of this particular island, and there's a huge part of the island of Hawaii as well, as well as several other places on Kauai, et cetera. So the U.S. has actually established its military base for the Pacific here in the Hawaiian Islands. And what that does is, is that it makes the Hawaiian Islands a principal target for any enemies of the United States, as we saw happen uh, during World War II, uh, when Japan uh, attacked the, the Pearl Harbor and the military facilities of the United States here in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, today, however, the, the method of warfare is, is much more serious uh, with nuclear bombs and nuclear missiles um, and all kinds of uh, uh, remote controlled devices uh, the, the Hawaiians are at, at particular risk because the na nature of warfare is much more uh, deadly and, and widespread than it could be. So Hawaii is now one of the primary targets of any enemy of the, of the United States. So anyone with nuclear capability would be targeting the Hawaiian Islands because this is basically the central command of all of the Pacific. Um, so the Hawaiian Islands would, would necessarily be, be the target that they would have to remove. However, because of the nature and the size and, and the uh, potency of the type of weapons that are being used, the Hawaiian Islands, we, the civilian population of the Hawaiian Islands are being put in grave danger because one nuclear warhead can wipe out the entire island of Oahu. And so this is where, why we are pushing for demilitarization not only demilitarization, but denuclearization of, of uh, the Hawaiian Islands. And we're pushing for it because it's survival. We are actually in imminent danger of being destroyed. Just a couple of weeks ago, the United Nations announced that the nuclear 
um, ban on, on uh, the ban on nuclear weapons went into effect. That was, I believe, uh, January 22nd. And we are very, very much in support of this to ban all nuclear weapons. And so uh, we are trying to do that as well as in our efforts to win back our country, to reestablish our country as a sovereign nation, we are, of course, pushing that our nation will return to its neutrality and be totally denuclearized and demilitarized so that we return a safe, uh, we return to being a, a country that's safe to live in, as well as a country that um, can be prosperous and can be helpful to other countries around us in the Pacific. So we're very pleased to be speaking with Okinawa and with um, uh, the Northern Marianas because uh, in partnership, we can achieve this. We believe we can push for the demilitarization of the Pacific uh, with this, with this uh, effort that we are entering. So mahalo nui for allowing me to speak. I'm really pleased to have participated in this uh, Human Rights Council uh, parallel event. So I will see you again soon. Aloha. Thank you, Minister Siu, for your words regarding the situation in Hawaii. For more on that, we turn to Madam Ruth Bolome, an heir and direct descendant of the royal line of Kamehameha, the original rulers of the Hawaiian Kingdom. She is an heir to the privately held lands of the Kamehamehas and is advocating for the repatriation of lands that were taken and sold illegally under the regimes of the U.S. territory of Hawaii and the present U.S. state of Hawaii. Madam Bolome, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Hello. Thank you for the honor of participating and the importance of demilitarizing the Pacific. I'll be discussing why it's imperative for two things to occur in the UN to prevent further harm to the Hawaiian Islands and its people. One, an emergency review of UNGA Resolution 1469, which falsely alludes to the world believing that the Hawaiian Islands is one and the same as the corporation calling itself Hawaii, the U.S. 50th state. Two, when confirming the false representation that is harming the Hawaiian Islands and its people, we asked the U.N. members to facilitate us in the deoccupation of the Hawaiian Islands by revoking U.N. GA Resolution 1469 in its first um, phase. My great-grandfather, or great-great-great-great, seventh great-generation great-grandfather, Kamehameha I, or also known as Kamehameha the Great, unified the Hawaiian Islands in 1810. Dr. Stephen Kerr, who was a world court litigator and special international legal counsel to the House of Habsburg, Lorraine, and a professor of law at Antioch University of Law in Washington, D.C. In his academic paper entitled Dynastic Law, he states in part where a, a dynasty was expelled from a territory, in other words, illegally deposed or dispossessed, and their state is incorporated into another the dynasty just lost their territory, but neither their status as a sovereign family nor their dynastic independence or royal rights and privileges are lost. A ruler who is deprived of an, the actual control of a country by either an invader or a revolutionary nonetheless remains the legitimate de jure sovereign of his country while the de facto government set up by the revolutionaries or the invaders is considered usurpers, both constitutionally and internationally. Sovereignty is not something that is decided by other countries. So in other words, the UN cannot decide who the sovereign of the Hawaiian Kingdom is. Neither can the United States. They can only recognize it or not. So who has the effective claim over the Hawaiian Islands? According to Dr. Kerr, as long as the state i.e. the Hawaiian Kingdom, keeps up its protests and claims the actual exercise of sovereignty is undisputable. The heirs of Kamehameha, the descendants of the 16 children, Kanakama Ole and Hawaiian nationals have, in fact, maintained their protests both privately and politically against the false U.S. annexation and 
the ongoing illegal occupation in the Hawaiian Islands. On December 20th, 19, 1849, the Republic of the United States of America made a tr uh, nation to nation agreement with the Hawaiian Island King under a treaty of friendship, commerce, and navigation. This was ratified in 1850 by both countries. And under Article 1, it says who that contract is with. There shall be perpetual peace, amity between the United States and the King of the Hawaiian Islands, his heirs, and his successors. So the heirs today can work with the United States for the deoccupation. They can work with the United Nations for the deoccupation of the Hawaiian Islands and the restoration of the Hawaiian Kingdom government. There are many heirs and there are uh, candidates that are the successor candidates, uh, lineal descendants that are ready to step up to create the government um, framework that's set forth in the Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution. We don't need an outsider to tell us how to set our government up. We essentially have the guidebook by our own constitutions. So as an heir of Kamehameha I and III, I continue my diplomatic protest to the, to the ongoing unlawful military occupation in the Hawaiian Islands, which is, ca which is causing daily harm to our people, whose administrative courts conspire and engage with private industry in the unlawful takings and assignments of private allodial title lands, dispossessing heirs for their entire lifetime to their rights to their inheritance. Municipal county permits and processes allows our environments to be destroyed it allows the destruction and desecration of our sacred cultural sites and burials. And all of this is prohibited under the laws of occupation as well as U.S. constitutional laws or federal laws. And yet it goes on with nobody hearing our calls or our cries. This tells us that we cannot trust the U.S. No matter what illusion they give us as being those wearing the white hats. On a regular basis, on a daily basis, our people are being harmed. And it's inexcusable. And it's unlawful. Historical documents revealed unscrupulous U.S. acts. And in 1941, during, the world, during World War II, the U.S. premeditated strategy to incite Japanese retaliation cut by cutting Japan off from American oil fueled the bombing of Pearl Harbor, which would give the U.S. a reason to declare war and join its European allies. Essentially, Europe won the war with the Hawaiian Kingdom's help, even though we didn't agree to it. This private incitement of war led to crimes against peace, brought grave harm to the Hawaiian Kingdom and its people, which both Great Britain and the U.S. had treaties of friendship, commerce, and navigation with. The death of innocent uh, civilians and inciting war on neutral nation soils are war crimes that the UN held Germany and Japan accountable for. The unlawful, ongoing military presence within our de jure neutral nation makes the Hawaiian Islands a target and a place to retaliate against the US by its enemies while leaving US soil and its military free of harm. The entire world is under the belief that the US 50th state is located in the Hawaiian Islands because of the report submitted by the U.S., the disingenuous report submitted by the U.S., report A4226, submitted on 24 September 1959 under the obligation of U.N. Charters Article 73E. Now, in this report, it specifically excludes 
the Hawaiian Islands and its description of Hawaii, the U.S. 50th state. I'm asking the U.N. General Assembly members to step up to make a review. And when you confirm this disingenuous, misleading, intentional, intentionally misleading definition, I'm asking you to correct it by revoking UNGA Resolution 1469. This is the first step that I believe you have to take before we can begin our occupation. And we need the UN, who is somewhat complicit in the current condition of the Hawaiian Kingdom, because there was a mistake, let's call it a mistake that was made, where somebody didn't check the definition against the map of the world. The Hawaiian Kingdom has its de jure independence. We need our de facto independence restored. And that can be done by the UN uh, United Nations members correcting their mistake. That misassociates our islands with the United States 50th state named Hawaii. Now the heirs of Kamehameha have not granted any license or right to use our kingdom's name in any form to the United States. This is intellectual property infringement and a direct violation of our treaties with the U.S. The U.S. president, vice president, senators, representatives, U.S. governors, state senators, representatives, federal and state judges, officers of the court, municipal county agents and agencies, as well as their employees, have taken an oath to uphold the U.S. Constitution and under Article 6, all to uphold all of its treaties and international agreements. This includes the 1849 treaty between the U.S. and the Hawaiian Islands, heirs and successors. Kamehameha's thirds, heirs and successors. So as an heir, I accept the affirmation person's oaths and invoke their liability to uphold their oaths, which require that under the law of occupation, only Hawaiian kingdom laws are asserted in the Hawaiian islands, which includes upholding private allodial title awards to the Kanaka Maoli during the kingdom governance. The Hawaiian kingdom became a party to the UPU treaty on January 1st, 1882. The Hawaiian kingdom has not withdrawn itself from the Universal Postal Union Treaty, and under its constitution, Article 12, the kingdom has to formally withdraw, which they did not. The U.S., who does not have a treaty of annexation with us, who is a, nothing more than a usurper and an occupier of our Hawaiian islands, does not have the power to cancel any of our treaties. The Universal Postal Union is a special agency of the U.N. since 1948. And therefore, the UN, through this special agency, recognizes the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent, sovereign nation. The UN officers also took an oath that regulate their conduct with the interests of the United Nations and not to seek or accept instructions in respect to performance of their duties from governments or any authority external to the, the UN organization. As an heir of Kamehameha I and III, and on behalf of the Hawaiian Kingdom, who is a party to the UN, UPU Treaty, which is part of, now part of the UN Special Agency, I invoke the oath of the UN officers to launch a review of UNGA Resolution 1469, which is to clarify the definition of Hawaii, the U.S. 50th state, is not located in the Hawaiian Islands. The current military expansion occurring in the Pacific and the U.S. military installations throughout the Hawaiian Islands make us a prime U.S. enemy target, even though we are not part of the U.S. For this reason, I implore the members of the U.N. to begin an emergency review of U.N. General Assembly Resolution 1469, if not immediately revoked, continues the ongoing malicious harm to the Kanaka Maoli and Hawaiian nationals fueled by U.S. greed 
U.S. expansionism, unlawful, ambitious overreaching, wrongful land takings, wrongful arrest, wrongful incarcerations, destruction and desecration of our sacred sites and burials, and continued treaty breaches. In 1893, 13 men usurped our kingdom and brought about, and today is bring, still bringing about grave harm and dangers to our people and our nationals. If the UN members don't come together to stop and connect violations of UN convictions under the rule of law, then world nations, big and small, will not be safe from usurpers who only motivate, whose only motivation is to rape countries of their resources and put citizens under their control. 2020 shows us that nothing is the same and that the will of the people are not oft, are often ignored. I pray for the awakening of mankind and for our courage to make right the wrongs that harm so many for commercial gain and greed. Now is the time for us to awaken to our best selves and to remember we can make a difference for a better tomorrow for all of our nations. Thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of this discussion. Aloha. I am Ruth Bolomay. Thank you, Madam Bolome, for your insights regarding how the U.S. military occupation of the Hawaiian Islands is harming the Hawaiian people. As all of our speakers today have confirmed, the U.S. military occupation of the islands of Luchu or Okinawa, the Mariana Islands, and the Hawaiian Islands is greatly harming local and native populations. Native Luchuans, Chamorro, and Native Hawaiians are jointly demanding an immediate removal of the U.S. military presence from our islands and a return to self-determination. As Representative Babalta pointed out, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples protects our rights and contributions. Article 3 guarantees us the right to self-determination. We ask that the UN and the international community at large keep their promise to protect the rights of Indigenous Peoples. For more information on the situation in the Northern Mariana Islands, please see the website ocw670.com. You can also contact Representative Babalta by email at rep.sbabalta at gmail.com. We also ask that you remember the plight of native Luchuans. As Professor Nakamura pointed out, Luchuans for generations have suffered from and struggled against the illegal U.S. and Japanese occupation of our islands. The UN must act to protect the rights of Luchuans and restore our independence in order to ensure that democracy, freedom, and human rights are provided for Luchuans. For more information on this, please check out our website at peaceforokinawa.org. You can also reach us by email at contact at peaceforokinawa.org. And we ask that the UN review and revoke UN General Assembly Resolution 1469 concerning Hawaii's self-determination in order to ensure the democratic rights of the Hawaiian people are protected. For more information on this, please see our upcoming side event titled The UN's Mistake, Hawaii's Self-Determination. You can also check out the website hawaiiankingdom.net or contact us at foreignaffairs at hawaiiankingdom.net. Native peoples across the Pacific often say that the ocean does not divide us, it connects us. The United States has intended to divide us by pitting us against each other as rivals via the transfer of troops between our island nations, but actually it has brought us closer together in our shared struggle against imperialism and militarism and to protect the things most precious to us. We are indigenous cousins with many close connections in our culture, history, values, and traditions, and we have a shared responsibility to care for each other that runs far deeper than any Western attempt to divide us. We would like to thank the United Nations Human Rights Council for having us today. We would again like to thank Encomendios for sponsoring this event, as well as two co-sponsors, the Kiwani Foundation and the Peace for Okinawa Coalition. We would also like to thank OCW670 and the Luchu Independence Action Network for your assistance. And thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in today. We'll see you next time.